especially learn more about myself and, and just, just knocking over my microphone. So I started off as a track and field athlete. Um, competed at a younger age in the sport of decathlon. Um, I had like an addiction to like doing all the things and uh, trained for the 96 Olympics, didn't make it, trained for the 2000 Sydney Olympics in the decathlon, uh, ended up getting injury. And that was the first opportunity I had to like transition over to a new sport of bobsleigh and uh, then competed in three Olympics in the bobsled and won a silver medal in the 2002 Olympics. Before bobsled, I played some semi-pro football, uh, had an opportunity to try out for the Orlando Predators, which is the arena team in Orlando. But at that same time, I was trying out for bobsled. And so when I made the bobsled team, the football thing kind of went to the side. Long career in both track and field, football, and then bobsled. Well, I think it was more of just mindset. The, the reality. When we break down athletes to their foundational thing, like a lot of the principles are very similar. It's just a matter of changing like, okay, track and field, I'm on the track, it's summertime, um, where bobsled is like, now we're in the winter time, we're running very similar to track, but now we're running on ice. But, you know, fortunately I just became a student of the sport and watched the athletes and listened to the coaches and watched a lot of video and just tried to implement like the things I was taught from them in a short period of time. And then it really worked out. But, you know, of course, like anybody else, when you completely switch sports a year and three months before the Olympics in a sport, you have no idea. Um, for most people, that would be like, yeah, there's no possible way. But he, he just basically looked at it as an opportunity to still chase the Olympic dream. And, you know, that was the goal is become an Olympian and represent my country. It was definitely a roller coaster of, of emotions. I clearly can recall like the day that the, the failure happened at the track at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. It was during the high jump and it was raining. And I remember laying on the high jump pads, realizing that my Olympic dreams and track and field were over. And, you know, I felt absolutely defeated. I felt like I let down my family and my friends and it supported me for so long. And, you know, there was a good probably three or four months of feeling sorry for myself because I felt like I failed and, and didn't accomplish my dreams. Thankfully, you know, when we had the opportunity to do bobsled, that was, that was the most exciting part. Cause it was like, oh my gosh, another opportunity. And I don't know anything about this sport, but you know, I know that I'm a great athlete and I physically have the attributes to be a great athlete and compete at the Olympic level. Now it's more of a matter of a mindset and putting it into there. It, a lot of it had to do with like just being like steady, steady minded, if you will, and just still believing in myself. It didn't matter the sport. It just mattered about like the passion of becoming an Olympian. My first medal in bobsled was a gold medal in the America's Cup. I won like back to back gold yeah. medals in two man and four man in America's Cup. And I was like, man, I actually like this. So the combination of the athleticism of pushing the sled and then going down this mountain at 90 plus miles per hour, I was like, wow, this is pretty neat, right? It feels like a little bit of, you know, track and field athlete and a little bit of NASCAR um, going down this mountain. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, once I, got that what we all a lot of athletes call that addiction that feeling of adrenaline and the competition i was like yeah i think we have a really good chance of doing this if we just kind of stick to the game plan and, and follow through and don't let anybody distract you because we, obviously we didn't have a lot of time america's cup gold medals and and then next thing i know i'm on the olympic team in my own hometown and win the first olympic medal for team usa in 46 years I was kind of pressured from family and friends like, okay, you know, now it's time. I had a daughter and, you know, the pressure to be home and be a father and go back to school and get a real job. And so I retired in, after 2006 and uh, went to work in the corporate world in the bank industry. And it was just like every day I would drive by a track on my way to work. And I saw, you know, I just see people out there running and I was like, I know I could do that. And then one day I just took took a day off work, even though I wasn't supposed to, and went to the track and worked out. And I was like, let's go ahead and train for one more Olympics and, and pursue, you know, the the goal of doing three Olympics and, and you know, retire when we want to, not because we thought we should from, you know, from everyone else. Training for the 2010 Vancouver Olympics was probably one of the most difficult 
comebacks for me. We just hit the 2008 recession. I lost my house. I lost my car, $250,000 in sponsorships. And uh, I was like, you know what? That, that's just part of the story. We're going to continue to keep going for it and, and hopefully make this Olympic team. I, I just didn't, I didn't want to leave anything on the table and have that story like, oh, I did two Olympics, but I could have made three. And so we just continued to stay focused and, and eventually made the team. And I was able to like leave my bobsled tree shoes on the track and walk away on my own. There was a good part and there was a bad part, but it was definitely the right time for me. I thought what I was going to do is go into chiropractic. Um, there was a scholarship that was offered through the World Olympians Association, and I could have all of my scholarship paid for. I even studied with our chiropractor on tour for the, like the last year and a half, two years. The plan was to go into chiropractic, and then I was like, oh, man, how many, how many years do I got to go to school to like be a chiropractor? And I was like, you know what? I think I can actually just do this on my own and, and reinvent the wheel but I didn't know what that was. You look back now and be like, ah, again, I should have done this, I could have done this, I would have done this, but I didn't. So having no game plan um, definitely led to a pretty bad, like eight and a half years post-retirement of a very chaotic, dark world for me. And uh, thankfully I was able to overcome that, but it was definitely not a fun time of my life. We didn't have a lot of resources um, within the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee for athletes to transition. And so I didn't feel like I had the support system. And then, of course, my family really didn't understand, like, where my mindset was when I retired. Because I was always told that, like, if you make the Olympics, you'll probably never have to work a day in your life. If you win an Olympic medal, all the opportunities will come to you. If you make the Olympics and you make it three times and you win an Olympic medal, everything's going to be handed to you in a way. I get off the plane from Vancouver to Salt Lake City and I'm like, okay, where are all the opportunities? And instead of like being engaged and, and proactive, I'm sitting there like waiting, like, okay, where is it? And they just never came. You know, it kind of goes back to that, that old adage that, you know, if you build it, they will come. There's some truth to that, but you still have to create your, your life and your architecture and you have to build that still and, and make it happen. And, I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that lesson. For me, um, it did spiral really bad. Loss of identity. Um, then I started trying to replace the the emotions and all that stuff with drinking and starting to party more. And, and when that wasn't enough, and I started adding on like, you know, recreational drugs and just doing a whole bunch of bad, really, really bad stuff that this led to significant, very severe depression that eventually led to a suicide attempt in 2016. Then I had this opportunity to connect with a, a guy named Chad LaFaber. You know, the conversation is like, do you lead life by default or do you lead life by design? On this side, if you lead life by design, everything in your life is going really, really well. On this side, if you lead a life by default, you know, nothing's going well. He said, well, you know, if you lead a life by default, it's not too late to take a look at your your architecture of life and acknowledge the things in your life that are not serving you. And one by one in the help of your community and support and family and friends, start to declutter those things out of your life and then replace them with more positive, inspirational, you know, things in your life. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I still have a chance learning more about myself. And, and who was, who was Bill Schiffenhauer without the Olympics and without sport? Right. I was still a great, amazing human being. I just had to learn how to transition my skills from sport and my education into this world, real world with support of community. And then was able to do that. You know, you could ask my family, my wife, my friends, do I complain a lot about like the pain and the injuries? Uh, maybe when I was 16 and I knew that I wanted to go to the Olympics, I was like, you know what, one day, you know, if I accomplish everything that I want to, it is what it is. I'm going to be in pain. I'm going to have injuries, but I earn those injuries. I earn this pain that I have. And so, you know, I jokingly complain about it, but at the same time, I wouldn't change a thing. I'm a partner in three technology companies. I'm a partner in two coaching and consulting firms. And and I sit on the board or I'm the CEO and, and COO of five different nonprofits. And then 
I also have an opportunity to um, broker some really crazy, amazing deals like all around the world. But most importantly for me, like I realized that not just being in service to others was really, really important to me, but the probably the number one driver to me, and it took me some time to figure this out, was like realizing how much value that I needed to place on family. Family was something that sacrificed for my Olympic career, and I missed out on a lot of that. When I realized how much value that that was for me, that gave me another driver to like have, you know, that part of my life as my Olympic career. So, you know, when I look at life in general, I'm like, okay, what's your, what's your inspiration and what's your motivation to keep pushing on? It's like me looking at my kids and me looking at my wife and my family members and saying, I have an opportunity to like create a Olympic championship in my family. And, and that's what gets me up every day and tries me to do better each, each and every day. I think there's some truth to that. A lot of people ask me, like, if you could go back, would you change anything? And I'm like, no, I wouldn't change anything because it's gotten me to where I am today. The value of my career is that instead of staying in the victim mentality, is that I decided to be a student of my career, the lows and the lows and the highs and the highs. And those lows helped me to become a better person instead of a victim, realizing that, you know, how many people around the world go through a lot of lows and they're not able to overcome that stuff? A lot of people. And then, you know, even my son's mom, you know, mentioned to me one time, she's like, I don't understand how you do it. And I was like, what are you talking about? She's like, you like have like the worst stuff that happens to you and every single time you find a way to overcome it at a high level coming from her meant a lot to me and that's what i also realized that you know what i need to share my story and share my experiences and be vulnerable to the world so that if somebody else hears the story they a light might go off in their head like oh my gosh he could do it and i could do it interesting thing there's just a little bit of an ongoing joke that i i talked to my, my wife about a lot because i reflect back onto the days before i started making this personal transformation and back then i was like praying to anybody who would listen god buddha whatever like please just give me one good day because every day was just chaotic for me and when i finally figured out my own alignment and all that stuff. Like there's kind of this ongoing joke that I'm like, oh my gosh, I have an amazing day every single day. So my low days are, I would say very different than most people. It's like my low days, like, okay, I woke up today and I don't feel very inspired to like get a bunch of work done. Like that's my low day, which I'll take that every single day over what you used to be. That's the, the greatness about like when you do like create a life by design and you do figure out a way to get in alignment with who you are and figure out what your passions are. There's no reason that you can't have an amazing day every single day. There's so many, right? The structure, accountability, being passionate about what you do and who you are, valuing yourself and being vulnerable in whatever space, you know, and I, I, I see that with even a lot of my clients is that they're so worried about what everyone is going to think about them or what they're going to say about them that that causes them to retreat into their own hole and they never are able to bloom. We live in this like omnipotent, omnipresent world where every possibility is there for us if we just allow it to happen. Figure out who you are and what you want to do and then go for it. We live in this beautiful world with amazing people and we don't have to do this journey on our own. So I would highly encourage you not to. And, you know, as athletes, you know, we're, we're used to community and camaraderie and collaboration. And when you make that transition from sport or, or business into another, you know, job, whatever it is, whatever that transition is for you, don't try to go about it on your own because we don't have to. There's, you know, we've, we've been on this earth for how long and how many other people have come before us and, and done the same thing and, and failed and found success. We don't have to have to have like that deep, dark failure and just get that taste of success on a daily basis. I always like to just ask people like, you know, before sport, what is it that you wanted to do? You know, when, when you take sport and you completely wipe it off the table, what are some of the things that interest you in life? I, I would also encourage them to like find ways to be of service to others 
and then ask questions. We always say that the creative mind is the child that survived in an adult. Kids always ask questions all the time. It's almost annoying sometimes, right? Questions, questions, questions. So when we get more in adulthood, why do we stop asking so many questions? Be interested, be engaged, be creative, and then take that accountability. Because at the end of the day, everyone's gonna give you advice, but at the end of the day, you're the one who's gotta take that step and move the needle. So again, just don't do it on your own and have fun. You know, with the great support and great coaches, we were able to do that and, and become very successful.